Trouble routing sound, new setup, here we go. TLDCS, welcome to. We have a special video Friday guest. A Friday guest, and his name is Jonathan Halls. Halls, Halls, Halls. He's here to say everything you'd want to know for Video Friday. Yay. And we'll have Matt Pierce here as soon as we finish with this intro. chat in the chat with no and anything you want to know about video be your question doom and then yeah there hopefully you better sound now yes Wow. You still hear me? Okay, cool. Welcome, Jonathan Halls. Yay! And Matt, too. I lost my audio. Here we go. There we go. Matt, sing now. Matt, this is your turn. What are you going to sing for us? <laughs> and up next, we have a very special singing guest for you, Matthew Pierce. Take it away, Matt. Me, it <laughs> I got kid. I got. I got songs I sing to my kids that will put them to sleep. So. Great for the audience. Yeah, you not for them. not for the <laughs> morning show. <probably. laughs> no, no, not not what you want. So, uh, welcome, Jonathan, um, and uh, I'm very excited to have you here today because I'm, you know, fanboy supreme of all of the work that you've done. And uh, for those uh, folks who don't know, some of what you've been up to for the last lifetime or so, could you condense it down for? Yeah. Well, I build furniture at home. That's what ah, I great. Yes, that's, that's, that's why. Of, you know, <laughs> no, actually, I've been um, working in the, in the learning space um, and the media space. So I come from a professional media background, ex-BBC, um, working with a lot of newspapers. And I left that. I was head of TV training for a while. And I left that to come into the uh, space where really most of my work now is only with learning professionals because I think the future of learning um, – it, it, well, it's irreconcilably going to be about media. You know, the big trends at the moment, what, micro learning, um, although I hate that title. It's such a cliche and we've been doing it for <laughs> anyway. But, yes, it's a fad. Micro learning, keep talking about that. Uh, we've got mobile learning. We've got um, content curation. They're the big three, three things people keep talking about. They're all based on media. And then you think to ourselves, virtual learning and e-learning, all media-centred. And then you think about the classroom, 
And it might not be all video or audio, but once again, we're using media to help people learn. So that's the space that I live in now. And um, I've been around the traps, talk show host, media executive, um, and homemade furniture builder. <laughs> and also have written a, a thing or two for ATD Press and developed their uh, uh, media certificate, uh, as well as working for the BBC, as well as maybe there's some, you know. Former some... talk show host? Yeah, um, I didn't know the talk show host. Um, yeah, that's right. That was a long time ago. You know what? I actually had my first talk show host dream in 15 years. It was really <laughs> weird because I wasn't a talk show host in this country. But if you talk to anybody who's been in, in, in live radio or television, they always have their nightmares. So the nightmare for me was being on the air ready to do a live read. A live read is when you say something along the lines, if you want your garage fixed, the only place to do it is because so-and-so Joe did it for me. And you kind of make it all personal. And I'm just about ready to go live uh, to do a live read for a restaurant. The microphone is open, the red light's flashing, and somebody is passing me a script and it's blank. <laughs> I haven't done it for 15 years. So maybe it was caused because I'm coming on your talk show. <laughs> well, you know, if you want to take over with your blank script at any point, feel free. So <laughs> totally welcome. All the off the cuff stuff is great. This is a completely blank script every Friday. <laughs> well, every weekday, really. Every, every, every day. day. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? Actually, that's a really good point about learning because when I think about the blank script, you know, I teach, um, I do a lot of train the trainer programs and I focus more on mid career trainers rather than the introduction train the trainers, how to write on the flip chart and turn it without making too much noise, more than mid stuff. And one of the things that I think is that a lot of the instructional design, the poor instructional design uh, activities that happen in some companies is all about that script and people get so wedded to the script, they lose spontaneity, they lose freshness, and then all of a sudden the learner is out of the equation and um, uh, the, the script is kind of like the holy grail and people walk out saying, well, wait a minute, I needed something different. Why couldn't the trainer actually respond to my needs? So I, I kind of think blank script is blank script with direction perhaps. You know, it's kind of like I live in Washington, D.C. I'm going to drive to D.C. Whether I take 66, 50, Route 7, uh, or the tollway, hopefully not the tollway, because I don't like paying money on the tollway. But you know what? Well, however I get there, so long as I get there, you know? So blank script is good. I like it. Yes. I, I, for those uh, in the viewing audience today who don't feel like they can improvise, how do you get through your day? Like just making that route decision for how to get to watch, like you're, you're improvising, you're working with, there's, there's a goal, you know, you want to get someplace, but how you get there is, uh, is part of the fun. Well, you know what, and this is interesting. So, um, you know, as I think about it, um, uh, Sam, you're, you're a musician, okay? You're an international musician. You've been on the stage around the world. Um, so I, I think about music, I, I'm a hack. I play the piano, I'm not very good, but my brother's a jazz pianist, we've talked about this. And I think about jazz music and really music, jazz music is all improvised on a chord progression. So you've got your chord progression, you never quite know how that's going to be expressed in the moment. Um, and that's kind of leading to a lot of spontaneity. It may be, I know this is not about video, um, but maybe our learning objectives are like our chord progression and the way we interact with people are like our, um, uh, the, the, the blank canvas, the, the script to kind of make things. You know, if I'm in the bird, uh, in bird land in New York and the guy out front has just had a row with his girlfriend and all of a sudden he's coming in angry. He's going to interpret that court progression differently than the week before when he was really happy and, you know, just come back from vacation. I guess. Not that I, I like this chord progression idea. Uh, we, yes, just yesterday we had a guest talking um, specifically about music with a, uh, an instructional design, uh, instructional designer who works in academia for a college, but does a lot of work, uh, has formerly been a music professor. So there's a really interesting kind of confluence of, of both of those worlds. And um, uh, yeah, there do tend to be a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in our L&D space that also have you know, at least some, some passion, musical talent and things like that. But I hadn't really thought of blending the, the, the structure of what we're up to as instructional designers. Uh, with some of those musical analogies. That's great. Then there's some of us with no musical talent and we're kind of glossy eyed thinking, 
I like listening to it, but I have no idea what you're talking about. Gord, what? <laughs> I don't have any talents. That's not. Like <laughs> but you know, when it comes to it, actually, I think analogies are so cool for us to be thinking about stuff because um, I did a, a an advanced training workshop in New York City last year, and one of the people on the program happened to be um, had just left being the chief concert pianist for a major European orchestra. I was enamored, absolutely enamored, and um, I was able to, to talk her into actually playing for us down at the Steinway Gallery, just down the road from where we're doing the workshop. And it was just, it was an awesome experience. But the analogies between um, music and learning, I think it, it gives us a nice mental framework to think about. So for example, in the classical phrase, uh, what is it? Um, Rubato, which is Italian for robbing time, um, I think that applies to training delivery because sometimes we're going to spend more time than we planned and less time than we planned on different things. So, but then if we go out of music, I, I was working with a guy. Um, uh, it was really fascinating. He he uh, was on a train the train program, and, and I know this is the trainer, not video, but he had a martial arts background, black belt, uh -huh. um, and we started looking at parallels between martial arts and how you handle classroom disrupt, uh, dis disruptions. And so I'm thinking about this from a neuroscience perspective and thinking about the amygdala and the limbic system and yada, yada, yada. And then all of a sudden he said, but you know what, this kind of correlates to martial arts. And he taught me something actually very interesting. I found out what a black belt really is. He said that a black belt is because you've been doing it so long, your, your belt used to be white. And it gets so dirty because you've been doing it. It's <laughs> darker and darker and browner and brown. All of a sudden, it's a black belt. So that was kind of interesting too. So you know, so that, you know, that's kind of the, the you, know, you know, it's not just music. Yeah, it's, yeah. There's plenty of analogies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's a new book. Hmm. Yeah, oh. the, the the book of training analogies. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of of books, um, you wrote. Uh, I'll get the title right. Uh, Rapid Media Development for Trainers. Yeah. Right? Uh, 2012. So I have the book. I just, the, the words get muddled. Um, so that's that five years old now. And um, I was wondering for that book, which is like, it's the book. This is, you know, the book for, uh, for folks that are showing up for Video Friday who are doing um, media development and training. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if there's anything in that book that you feel like you need to, uh, to update or would change at this point based on the changes in technology, or is it just, um, is there more uh, commonality between how we approach things now as opposed to five years ago, or you've been working in the industry a very long time? There's nothing that needs to be updated, but I'll tell you a few things. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to undersell the book. You know, that, um, that book is how I get vacations, right? More, more oh, people. <laughs> which, is, which is why it is the seminal work that all oh, of you should rush out and buy. Yeah. So, um, you know what? I think um, if, um, if we were to go and, and update that, and I'm certainly not updating it in six months because my brain is too packed with other things at the moment. But in six months' time, if I sit down, a couple of things I'd probably look at. First of all, I'd look at 360-degree cameras. And how they can be used uh, for, 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 for learning. Um, I'd probably look at virtual and augmented reality as well, but more of a philosophical rather than a technological perspective. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more of a, an editorial than a technical person. Um, and, you know, Matt and I, we've known each other for 100 years, and, and, and you know my aversion to technology because I'm interested in the story. You know, I'm interested in the story, and I see the technology is the tool we use to get to the story. Um, so I'd probably really focus more on the philosophical stuff and the stuff that I, I, I'd want to review. And, I, and I've, my last book, which is, uh, so that was Rapid Video in 2012. The last book, 2016, uh, was Rapid Media. So it was podcasting, video, writing, and graphics. Um, and, um, and, and graphics was actually a, a guest chapter by Connie Malamud, who is an awesome awesome specialist in graphics. So I'm really thrilled that she would. Yeah, uh, we need to get her her her. You should, she's, she's terrific. Um, but um, I would probably go back to the, um, to the original book and I'd do a few things. I'd probably look at the workflow. I think we're at the point in the learning profession 
where it's no longer, hey, look, I can make video. It's, hey, I've got to make good video. And yeah. I think we need to be really raising standards. And there are a couple of things. I wrote a series of posts for trainingindustry.com this month and next month. Um, and one of the things I said is we need to really be looking at what are the standards for video. There are no standards for video. And I did a, a video thing to um, a group of people in Atlanta last week, and somebody sent me a LinkedIn and they said, you know what, Jonathan, um, I see a lot of video that really is pretty much crap in the training world. What do we do about that? And I think that's what I'm thinking about in particular. Just because we can do video doesn't mean it's going to be good. So I think we need to have standards in terms of ethics, in terms of quality, in terms of editorial, editorial sequences. Um, and we don't have that. So that's something that I'm doing a bit of work on at the moment. I'm hoping that we can kind of really push. Um, another thing that we need to look at is more style. So we have style guides for websites. We have style. Every newspaper I've worked for, we've got a style guide. We need to do that for video. So what kind of captions do we use? What fonts are we using? Making sure they're consistent and looking at how we can brand content. If we can do micro content, and micro, uh, micro learning, video micro learning in our organizations, if I'm a big company, a Fortune 500 company, people come back to look at my video. I want them to know that they're saying the Acme Widgets Company video and they can trust me. So the branding and consistency, and all that kind of stuff. So that's a big piece, I think, in what I would probably look at with reviewing the, the, the book. The next thing is workflow. Every uh, This sounds really arrogant, um, but I'm going to say it anyway because I We're say it. How, friends. <laughs> <laughs> if I go to a TV station or a radio station, I know pretty much whether or not they're effective. You don't need to tell me whether they're rating or not. I can just tell by the buzz, the way people are doing things, the way they're working because I've been in the in the game for a while. Um, Sam, it's like you go in and you see a band and you see if they're kind of faffing about kind of being kind of, you'll know pretty quick whether they're amateurs or whether they're professional. Same thing goes, um, Matt, you know, you, you're in the technology space with Camtasia. You can see people who get it because you've been there. So um, one of the things that I have found distinguishes the newspaper companies, the TV stations and the radio stations that are doing it really well is they've got an effective workflow and they're following that workflow consistently. Mm -hmm. If it's just one person, it's helpful. It saves time, it makes things fast, and you avoid mistakes that need to be fi uh, fixed later on. If you've got a team of two, three, four, five more people, it becomes even more effective. So the standards piece is what I'd look at. The second thing is really the workflow. And I think in rapid video, I didn't pin that down. And I've probably in the last 12 months really pinned that down a lot more. Um, and I think that that becomes an important thing. Workflow seems boring because you do the same thing the same way every week. But actually, it's not because workflow uh, frees you up from the routine tasks to really become creative. And so um, I've got an eight-step an eight step workflow that I now teach to, to folks because I think it's not the perfect workflow, but it speeds up and it creates consistency. So that's kind of um, the, the big things that I'd look at. And the other thing, and I'll shut up because I know I'm moving on like a lunatic here. <laughs> no, that's um, great. I um, this I'm actually contemplating a career change. I think I'm thinking of becoming a gardener. No, not really. But I'm thinking of doing a whole lot less work with professional media and really focusing on the learning space because it's like going from a PC to a Mac. You know, you got it's like whoa! I've got to kind of grind out of one one kind of system and start thinking. And um, the media world is changing even faster than the learning world. Um, it's probably at the same, but it feels faster because I think. Um, media folks uh, are really struggling to kind of keep up with where that change is. But um, I still am being judged on a lot of international media con contests. So the digital, um, the Asian Digital Media Awards and uh, the Global Media Awards for INMA, the International News Media Association. And it gives me a ringside seat to some really exciting innovation and some real crap too. Um, but one of the things I've seen with the innovation uh, has been to do with things like 360 degree video and uh, augmented reality and stuff. At the moment, we're getting so wrapped up by the technology, we're forgetting about what it's all about. So one of the submissions, I'm not going to tell you who it is, I couldn't do that anyway for ethical reasons, but one of the submissions was a major disaster in a developing world country, or some of my friends call it the majority world countries. Mm -hmm. So it was tragic. Lots of stuff, really, really bad, um, and a huge... Trying to say this without 
being identified here or identifying it. A huge major construction infrastructure literally fell down, okay? Hundreds of people killed. It was horrible. Mm. So they put a 360-degree camera in so that the news viewers could actually look around and see the devastation. To me, as a storyteller, that was incredibly rich because if I'm a writer, um, it, can, it can take me four or five paragraphs to even come close to the devastation that I'm trying to describe. And my job is to describe that devastation as a writer. With a 360-degree camera, I can do that in the space of 15 seconds. So anyway, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is really cool because storytelling isn't about technology. It's about what goes on in the head. And I'm watching this and all of a sudden they're editing the 360-degree. So I'm getting a chance to start looking around and then all of a sudden they've cut to the camera somewhere else near this big bridge. And I'm like thinking, whoa, I haven't got any control. And I think the big shift that's taking place, and it's happened in learning for the last 50 years, we've just used different words for it, but the big shift that's taking place in media is we're now giving the story experiencer, the reader, viewer, whatever we call them, much more control than ever before. Mm -hmm. So if they want to pause and look at something for a little bit, like in a classroom, we want to spend a bit more time exploring one concept because they need to spend more time on that. We let them do it. But the problem is, in this particular content, they made the decision when to cut from camera location to camera location. And I think we need to be thinking very carefully about what we're using the technology for. And Marshall McLuhan, he's famous, isn't he, for um, the meaning is a message. And I've been in the media now for 30 years. I still don't understand what that really means. I don't even think I agree with it. But he said something I think was far more powerful. And he said, at the advent of television, um, we're driving forward looking into the rear vision mirror. And even when it started, I mean, my wife and I, we're, we're really sad. We've been watching I Love Lucy's. Uh, I mean, you, you can't get better than that, right? No matter how sophisticated we are in HBO and all that. And so, anyway, two cameras, it's a stage rep reproduction. So they saw it as a theatre stage rather than seeing it as a medium that right, can take right. you everywhere. So I think the challenge is not just saying what we can do, but really saying, let's stop looking at video doing this or 360 or virtual reality and start saying, what do the learners need and how can I bring that technology? I'll shut up. There you go. That's, that's just my thoughts. Yeah, no, no, you're not here. That's why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys have got huge insights too. I don't want to kind of hog the conversation. Actually, if, if it's okay, I have a question. Getting a little feedback. Um, uh, so we talked, you talked to Jonathan about, um, you know, the consistency, the branding, doing those things. Um, one of the things I've noticed is it feels like, and I could be completely wrong, but it feels like video production and like stylistically kind of where it's going is making big leaps. Like if you have something that looks the same way as it did a year and a half, like 18 months ago, it's going to feel dated. And so how, what's your suggestion for like moving, keeping up with that, but still keeping that consistency, the branding, all those elements. So you're, it's unified yet. It's not, you're not feeling like oh, I'm lagging behind on kind of the, it looks old. Yeah. So, um, I think the first thing I would probably say, so if, if I'm the New York times, um, the New York times has got a, a huge amount of followers who are dedicated to the journalism, the style of journalism and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things I noticed about the New York Times, and I've, when I used to teach uh, web news writing um, for journalists, I used to use the front page of the New York Times as an example of how not to make websites mm -hmm. because it went against everything in the usability studies. Back then, if, if you, you – know, and it wasn't just Jakob Nielsen and those guys who were the heavyweights back in those days, and they're still heavyweights, um, but all the research said don't use – Times New Roman is a font because it's a serif font um, and it's going to be heavily pixelated on screen. Um, you know, write differently. Don't just copy and paste. But they did all that and um, they still had their following. And I think their following was because people identified with the, the ethos, the style, the brand, the values, the ethics and all that kind of stuff. And interesting, people who don't like the, the New York Times identify with not liking it because of the brand or, you know, same thing. So I think that probably what we need to do is be more focused on some of the editorial ethics side of things 
and have maybe the colours and the brands are the same, but we might do things differently. And if you look at TV station um, identities throughout the world, you'll find they've got those, I mean, the BBC logo. Okay, so my old employer, um, the BBC logo has gone through different iterations over the years. And when you see that logo, um, you say, ha, ah, that's a certain stamp of quality or disquality if you don't like the quality of the BBC. But that's, that's how it is. And whether they spin it, whether they use different graphics, I think, so I think I'd be inclined to probably think about those things. And I know that sounds not real direct or concrete. I think probably more the abstract side that, 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 that makes that work. I don't know. What do you, I mean, what do you think? Do you, I mean, you, you've got some thoughts I'm, I'm imagining too. No, I actually, I agree with you. I think, um, I think what's important is that you're continuing to evolve in the right ways that at, at the end of the day, whether I'm using the current logo or the, the, the logo from a year ago probably doesn't matter as much, but am I doing some things you talked about? Am I telling a good story? Am I making compelling content that's worth viewing? Is it actually helpful content? Um, and then, and being willing to progress your style, whether that's, you know, camera or uh, technique and, you know, other techniques you might use, um, as it makes sense, but not necessarily also pushing it. Um, because I think, I mean, there's a limit that you don't want to be looking like you're in 1987, uh, and, and producing for content for 2017 learners. But if that's what you've got and you can make it still good content, then there's a question there is that, you know, does that work? And if it works and it works for your audience, cause they're okay with it. Um, where else can you invest that time and effort into like, you know, again, editorial, good story. Um, and that's been something I've been thinking about is how do you make the best possible content without worrying about the aesthetics of everything else? And I think it's interesting. So what you, you and I usually get together once a year at, at Tech Knowledge in Vegas and hooray, it's going to San Jose at long last. And, you know, why do we get together? Usually it's an obscene 6.30 breakfast because I'm kind of rushing off to another thing. And you know what? Why do I, why do I have a breakfast with you? Um, because... We enjoy our conversation. We respect each other. We we think what each other have to say. Well, I do for you. I don't know about you. I don't know yeah, about of course. <laughs> I I actually want to hear what you're saying because I value it, right? Yep. And I don't really care with you're wearing a wide brown tie. Not that I've ever seen you wear a tie, but you know, 1970 style. I will whatever. next time. I will next time. <laughs> with a t-shirt, right? <laughs> and, and so that, in, in my mind, that's kind of what we need to focus on. You know what's interesting? One of the problems, I call it a fad factor. Our industry is just chock-a-block full of fads. And part of the problem with that is that um, there are people you know, like me who work for themselves and you've got to get the next gig. So we've got to come up with something sexy and fashionable, a new word or whatever else. And so every year we've got this new fad coming through. And um, I think of the, the, the quote from Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Micro-learning. You know, it used to be called granular learning. Before that, it was just-in-time learning. In the 70s, job aids. I mean, frankly, what's new about that, really? But we're packaging it. You know, I know I'm, I'm putting together a course for a client. I'm micro-learning. And what's different? Well, we're, we're going to put it in the new trends. And I think that for the authenticity thing, um, really spending too much time worrying about um, the, the superficial stuff can really take us away from the learning. I don't know if that's kind of making sense, it's, but, it, but it comes back to the content and being able to continually deliver credibility and you know, robust stuff. So, yeah. That's great. Um, well, speaking of the, the importance of, of branding and, and timeless logos that we all can appreciate, um, this is our, our mid-roll break for TLDC, which is more than just a chat. It's more than just the, the daily, always free live stream. Um, live streaming, of course, would never be called a fad. Uh, it's a place for us to connect, just like we would at, at Technology or any of the other conferences that are happening. And there is a conference for TLDC, which, um, great, Craig is now putting in the chat. And uh, if you're interested in that, you should come. It'll be really fun. It's, it's different than the normal conference where there's just a bunch of people and there's the big expo hall and it's all about you know, selling stuff. This is capped at 100 people. 
and it's 100 quality people. So, so really great conversations and stuff like that. If you're interested, click the link in the chat. And also I believe, uh, there's a, a member button as well on your screen. Um, while this chat is always free, um, you can tune in anytime to all the recordings. There's podcast versions that Luis is making now, which is great. Um, it really does make a difference to the ongoing quality of TLDC, the whole community. Um, if you can subscribe and, uh, you know, contribute a little bit just as we're contributing value to you every day. Okay. Commercial placement now done. I'm pretty sure there's a quality meter at the door, right? They, it's with the wand and they wave your, well, not your, sorry, Matt, you're not quality <laughs> enough. We'll put you on the will call list. Maybe <laughs> well, yeah, that, that brown tie, I, I don't know. <laughs> and the t-shirt. Just... Kind of work. Um, you can go to this line, sir. Is that the line where you get that x-ray machine that goes right round, like at the airport? Yeah. Yeah. It, oh, it, yeah. Yeah. Scans it like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think they're, they're working on one of those. Yeah. Uh, but except it'll, it'll like spin you into this whole, uh, you know, AR vortex that then you're, you're seeing the overlays of all the other people in the airport and identities and stuff. Uh, <laughs> we're going to have that, right, Luis? Just like, uh, just like the science fiction. Hey, can I ask you guys a question? So I'm interested to know, are any of you guys working on virtual reality or augmented reality? I mean, that's, that's a real buzz at the moment. We do have some folks in the chat who are um, Marco Ficini, who's here, and it's his birthday. Happy birthday, Marco. Happy birthday, Marco. I don't, Marco. Know, I don't know why he's spending his birthday with us, but okay, whatever, uh, whatever works. Um, he's doing some cool stuff in, in the uh, VR space. Um, and uh, I know that Toddy has done a little bit. I'm not sure if she's here this morning as well. So we do have some folks in the chat who are doing that kind of work. Personally, I haven't had the opportunity yet. Um, I, uh, I just was at the, uh, the Realities 360 um, conference. I didn't actually get to attend the conference due to a conflict, but just being around it, like this, there's starting to be a lot more activity, but everyone's kind of looking around for like, okay, well, who's doing the stuff? What can I get in on? You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not doing anything right now. I mean, where I'm focusing my time is uh, traditional video production as well as uh, doing a lot more with live video. Uh, so streaming video through Facebook Live, we've uh, taken some initiative on with uh, that here at TechSmith. And so I've been working on figuring out, you know, how do you do more than just hold your camera on your phone up and, and do it? So yesterday we did a production, um, kind of we be, being able to play a video back and then go talk about the contents of that video was something we did yesterday. Um, so trying to figure out how to do that well and grow audience uh, which is, you know, an interesting different type of challenge than just video. But no, no AR or, or VR for me. Although I am excited to see what Apple brings. And I know, Jonathan, that's a dirty word for you is Apple. Um, but they are releasing stuff in their next iOS that is particularly built for virtual or augmented reality. And uh, so that will be interesting to see because that, you know, whether you like them or not, it's going to, we're going to see more and more steps in this direction of what, what can be done. And I think that just makes it more and more accessible to those of us who, you know, maybe aren't quite ready to, to take that leap into that, that space. It's interesting too. I think we need to, I mean, I know what you guys think, but I think we need to be really um, embracing the opportunities, but also um, being firmly anchored to, to what the purpose is in learning. And, and do you, yeah. you see in your practices, do you see people who are, kind of doing it for the sake of hey look i've got this virtual reality or i've got video look what i can do rather than having a good defense as to why that will lead to achieving a learning outcome for example i've, I've never seen anything new and sparkly come through just because it's new and sparkly have you matt um <laughs> you know i feel like there's one time in the 90s but <laughs> not since yeah, uh, well, I think when, when people are first dabbling in the technology and don't know what it can do in order to, you know, make a big show of it, they make a big show of it as opposed to, you know, the, what is this for? This is for learning. It's not for the entertainment value. It's not for the, you know, the sale. But um, yeah, so far, um, it, well, as you mentioned before, there, there are legitimate challenges and things that we just don't know how to do as well like from a storytelling perspective when you give someone that in your 360 example when you give someone that that experience what 
how are you crafting that experience for them? It's, it's not like you can direct per se, you know, like, or, or that you, that you can, um, that you can ensure that someone is going to see something in that 360 degree, like, like what the next step is, or, or, you know, how do they get to the next, just that basic orientation of, uh, of how they know where they're at and how they get to the next learning objective, whatever that may be. Um, I don't think we know how to do that so well yet. I feel mm. like there's, it's a two balance. It's a two sided thing, right? Like we don't, we may, uh, have technology available to us and we're just starting to figure out how to do that and do that well. And then, you know, fitting in all the other things that we know make for good learning, but then there's the experience side of things for the learner as well. Whereas how are they going to react and what is their experience going to be? And are they going to be able to learn? Um, and so I feel like we're trying to, we've got both sides of this coin yet that we've got to figure out. And, um, and there are some who are obviously further ahead, but I feel like, there's a long, long way to go. And I think it's still true for video. I think, um, as you said, Jonathan, we're, you know, John, we've been able to do video on our phones for quite a while now, which makes it accessible to almost everybody. However, to do that well, we still haven't got that good, solid framework for, or pieces in place to make it a, a, a comp always a compelling medium to use. Not that you should you always use it, but there, I think there's a lot of things that are, are missing or we have gaps in our knowledge that it's like, gosh, I could do video, but if I do, it's not going to be as good as if I just write it or if I do a other type of medium presentation. Mm -hmm. well, it's interesting. If I could interrupt here, uh, it looks like um, we have someone from the chat. There's a movement growing to bring Greg on screen as well, who's done a bit of, uh, of work in this space. So, uh, so I just set the invite. We might see our squares rearrange here and just, hey, here we go, right it's now. Greg. Hello. This is like live, <laughs> live action. I mean, you know, this is. <laughs> this is my second time for being uh, thrown in at the last minute. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I gotta get my headphones and close the door. <laughs> what am I wearing? <laughs> Where are you going this from? Um, so I'm in Columbus, Ohio, at Ohio State University. And I was on once before talking uh, about uh, VR with Marco. I was kind of thrown in the last second and uh, I don't know how much I have to add here other than uh, what I was saying in the chat is my experience with 360 video in VR is that it seems very uh, low res at the moment. Even when I see 4K streams and you put it in VR and it's kind of close to your face, you know, it's, it's not bad, but, um, and like you said, the story is the important thing. But it, for me, it takes me out a bit when I'm using an app and it's so crystal clear and things are, you know, in 3D. And then I see the video and I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. I lose something sometimes. And, you know, there's all kinds of videos out there. And it seems to me a lot of them are not in true 3D, which kind of takes me out of it, too. Or maybe they're not even video. They're just photos. And there's a lot of tricks going on. And I see the seams. You know, I turn around and that yeah. kind of takes me out of it. Um, so I think we're getting there. I'm just looking forward to that day when we do get there. It's interesting you say, because I, I, a couple of things are kind of springing to my mind there. And um, uh, one, which I'll come back to and make, make everybody envious, but um, the first thing is with innovation. And innovation is, uh, I think there's that necessary first stage where we have to do stupid stuff to kind of push it out. And I remember in, in Britain, we, um, I think it might've been Sky Sport, when we had the multiplex on uh, digital interactive television, which is something that never quite made it to America, but interactive TV where you could change the scenes and all sorts of fun stuff. So they did a soccer match with five or six different cameras and you could change the angle of the camera. So if you're watching soccer and you want to watch the, the bird's eye view looking down, quick, get your remote control, click it. And if you want to do the goal at your, behind your team, click it. Of course, it took a while because it's like changing a channel effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was such a gimmick. Everyone said, wow, this is so cool. And then nobody followed it through. Um, but then a couple of, maybe a year or two later, the BBC came along and they said, well, you know what? It might not be to change the camera angle because it's better having a director in a control room who sees everything at once and knows exactly how to anticipate where that ball is going. Maybe what we should do is just give people the, the option to change the court at Wimbledon so they could go from different courts there. So the technology, we had to kind of do that and, and that nasty, fuzzy stuff. You know, I'm thinking that you kind of got to get through that part uh, uh, as well. But the other thing that resonated when you were, is it Greg, sorry? Greg, yes. Yeah, Greg. The other thing that uh, resonated, Greg, when you were talking about, you know, it's a story that counts. And I'll never forget 
and this is where some folks will be quite envious. I've actually been in the TARDIS. Like I've been in the real TARDIS. <laughs> I'm walking around backstage behind a, a television centre in London, and this is... And it's bigger than it looks, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bigger, always bigger on the inside. It's, it's, it's absolutely... I had to suck my breath in to go inside. But anyway, that was back when I was a little bit fatter in those days. But anyway, the, um, the Doctor Who. So I, I really haven't followed Doctor Who for the last 10 years. Um, I was still at the BBC when it was relaunched, but I grew up watching Doctor Who. It was my TV show. And um, talk to anybody in the Commonwealth, whether it be England, New Zealand, Australia, they all grew up watching Doctor Who from behind the sofa because it was scary in those days. <laughs> and so um, I had this fantastic opportunity my first or second year at the BBC. I put out, I published a series of workbooks on how to make web pages. And I decided I'd do it on Doctor Who because of course, Doctor Who was extinct in those days. So I went and spent a whole afternoon in the Doctor Who archives. And I got one of the old videos of Patrick Troughton. Patrick Troughton, I think was the second Doctor. Yeah. All black and white. And I took it home to my flat in Pimlico, which is just near Victoria Station in London. And one Friday night, my flatmate was gone. I said, right oh. So I bought some beer, I sat down in front of it. I, I put the DVD into my computer and watched it black and white it was horrible and then Patrick Troughton one of the scenes sneezed and the set wobbled <laughs> it was kind of back in those old days but you know what within about two or three minutes all those production values went away and I was sucked in and I couldn't believe I spent like two or three hours watching the entire what would probably two hours actually watching every single episode of black and white and I think it comes back you know to Matt you were talking about the what is it that we need to do not to appear out of date? I think we've got to be hip and funky and up to date or whatever. Actually, funky means something else here in America, but um, hip and cool. But um, we are always going to have the value by, by that story. And I think the question then becomes, how is this new technology making the story more immersive? How is this new technology drawing, if it's entertainment, my viewer in, if it's learning, how is it making it a more valuable experience? Because at the end of the day, um, no matter what some people think, learning doesn't take place in our videos. It takes place in the head of the people doing the learning. The video is only a tool at the end of the day. So how can we make it and more immersive? And, you know, you were saying, Sam, how do we get them to look at that part in the 360-degree um, video piece that's really going to unlock, unlock the learning? And at the end of the day, we can't force them to learn. I'm a big fan. I know Carl Rogers is out of fashion these days um, from a you know, learning theorist perspective. But he said, I can't teach you anything. I can only help you learn. And I'm a big fan of, of, of that. And so really the question is, how are we using this to help people learn via, via the story? How about that? I just started ranting for a bit longer than <laughs> It's so, all right. It's okay. Oh, oh excuse me. Uh, oh, the, the reality is. <laughs> I love Damn, rooms are bigger than they look. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. <laughs> excuse me. Well, well thanks <laughs> for uh, popping in, Greg, to, to ask that question. Um, and, and for the, the ramble there, too, uh, Jonathan, it's, it's, it's really interesting to have your perspective on, on all of this. Um, so to resolve the difference between these two things, um, uh, how is it that, uh, what's the kind of, uh, minimum, uh, standard or, or spec that you're looking for, Jonathan, uh, for what constitutes, a, a decent learning experience? And, and I'll let you think about that while I ask the same question to Greg, what is it that's the minimum kind of, okay, we got this right that you're looking for? for a learning experience. Greg? Cool, copy Greg. <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to go first. <laughs> okay, well, well, I just was letting Jonathan go second because he'll probably go longer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would just compress it to uh, what we were, you were speak, saying before and we've said in other podcasts or web chats is, you know, it all comes down to the story and what the, who you're trying to learn or teach and uh, your audience. Um, if, if I can uh, throw in one other thought before I forget it, it's a little sure. bit off of what you're asking, but um, I was thinking of uh, what was said before about the I Love Lucy and, you know, the two camera setup. And, you know, I think 
we are where we are in VR and with 360 video is kind of that same idea. We're way mm -hmm. back in the old black and white TV where you had one or two camera setups. And now when you look at TV and, and movies, we have all these cuts, we cut so quickly and all that. And we've kind of learned and taught the audience how to um, experience things. And, you know, it's okay to cut things within a second or two, which is really amazing. And, you know, with VR, it's so new and 360 video, we're not, we're still, got, we haven't figured that out yet. And we haven't figured it out yet. And in a way that's really exciting because we don't know it yet. We don't know the best way to tell these stories. Um, and we'll figure it out, I think. But yeah, we're way back at the beginning. So that's my, what I'm gonna add. That's a good analogy. Thanks, Greg. Can I add something to that too as well? Because I'm, I think that's our challenge. How do, we, how do we use this technology to tell our stories? I wonder if we can take it one step further. And maybe this sounds surreal. But can we provide, can we use the technology to provide stuff that other people can tell those stories? So in a sense, um, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of thinking that we're, we're in the, the post-industrial world um, and command control and all that kind of stuff. So we're broadcasting the story out. How would it be if we gave up that sense of control and allowed the learner to have that control? And we already know the learner's got that control. They will interpret anything we say through their memories. That's how their brains work. Um, and it's interesting when you think about the whole training world, we've spent the last 40, 50 years in the modern industrial training, vocational training world, thinking about how do we package and present our information so they get it right. Um, seemingly oblivious to the fact that actually everyone's going to use different memories to make sense of what we're doing anyway. So there's no absolute way, no absolute, no absolute way to make sure they get the same picture in their head as everybody else does. Mm -hmm. So what would happen if we actually looked at that technology and say, well, we're going to let go and see what you make of it. Um, I mean, there's some really um, interesting, um, I think, experiments, you know, the whole idea of nonlinear narrative and stuff. And I know once again, that's a cliche and all that kind of stuff. Um, I saw that, well, hang on, there's, there's a, in some of my workshops on transmedia in learning and stuff like that, I show a video and I'm, I'm happy to dig that video out and share it with you guys. You can email it afterwards. Um, sure. But um, there's two videos, in fact, one that was done in Sweden, interactive video where um, they actually had immersive audience participation in the video and they created the video as they went along. It was really, really cool. And they took the audience perspective to help write the script, almost kind of discovery-ish, discovery, not discovery, -ish, um, I'm thinking of feeding the TV show now. There was a oh, mental bank, mental bank. Uh, I'm not Truth about enough. Marika. Marika is definitely one of them. Yes, Matt, you know, you know exactly the two. And I wasn't thinking about Marika. I was thinking about there's another Hollywood film where they help the audience response write the script. But Marika is exactly the one in Sweden. So um, truth about Marika. In fact, Matt, you've got the URLs. Maybe <laughs> I'll see if I can dig, dig it up. I, I put a, a, a Wikipedia link in the uh, in the chat already, so that might uh, get oh, some cool. somewhere. And the other one is the witness. And the witness is where they use. Um, uh, Virtual, uh, augmented reality, not virtual reality. And people are using phones to really interact with the, the, the story. And I think that once we've got to find the balance between letting go and then being able to influence, the more we control, the, the less control we have. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going into tricky territory here because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I, I think as we go forward, the question is, have a look at those videos and we'll get the links to you. Um, I think they're really exciting experiments in, entertainment television that we could translate into the educational world um, for onboarding, all sorts of training opportunities as well. So yeah, but back to your question, um, Sam, what, what's the minimum? I think at the end of the day, um, the, the criteria is always, how does it help people do something? And I think that if you need to see something, it's gonna be good for video. If you don't need to see it, maybe podcasting or written content or graphic um, job aids are going to be a far more efficient and effective way of conveying that information. But what we do know is that when you're keeping the action on the screen, when you're changing shots, um, when you're really um, making it visually engaging, that's always going to be effective. It's when it becomes distracting and we notice the technique that I think the video goes south. So if I notice that someone's doing starburst transitions every 15 seconds, <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm noticing the technique. I'm not noticing the content. If it's been poorly shot because you've got wobbly cam, you know, yeah, you've got wobbly cam going on. Well, that's going to be poor video. So I can't do that. So I think 
really the question is um, the standard comes to, and whether it's done on a cell phone or whether it's done on a 4K camera, I see 4K cameras doing what I call 4K RAP. That's my new buzzword. I, I got that with a friend just the other day. I see 4K cameras being used for pure crap because they're not being used well or properly. So that's why I now spell crap with a K. So I think really at the end of the day is, is there anything distracting me from being able to do what I'm learning on camera? And if there is, it's probably poor quality video. Um, if it's not, well, it's probably going to be hitting the mark. And then we that's the entry level. And then after that, we start thinking about the branding, the consistency and, and the stuff that we we're talking about earlier on wearing brown, wide, 1970s style, so it looks like it's up to date and all that kind of thing. Just joking. Well, and, and you say, is it a, a cell phone or is it 4K? Like, that's the same thing these days with the technology. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, it, buy a phone that doesn't do 4K right now. Like, you have to look for one, actually. <laughs> if you're buying a new one, they all do. Um, well, uh, you? what's that? Can I ask you what you think? What do I think about which part? Standards. What What are the standards to achieve? The question you asked me. How oh, for the achieve? answer of my own question. Yeah, um, I'm working on that actually very actively, and um, I think that the standards are things that, if we establish them from a technical perspective, um, they're always going to be just as dated as the brown tie. You know, I think doing it from a uh, from a perspective of are we meeting the goals that we set is is the approach that i'm taking so it, it can be very very different from um from project to project from company to company from culture to culture mm -hmm. what it is that you're trying to accomplish has to fit through all those filters it's not important um that all of it be the same through any company and culture, but it's very important that there was a goal in the first place, that it is measurable, and that we can measure that we did it. So that's the kind of perspective I'm taking on that question. And that's kind of part of my reason for asking it in the first place. Matt, do you have that, a, a, a thought on that? Um, I don't want you to get off scot free. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. I'm, I guess I should have been paying attention, guys. I was looking up links. I don't, I don't have, no. Uh, I, I, I think. I think the interesting thing about uh, I, I, cause I like Sam's answer that it's not necessarily a technical standard cause that that's a moving target, but it is interesting. And I'll put this in the lens. We just made a video for a promo for a conference that we're going to several, a couple of people on uh, myself and two of my coworkers are going to be speaking at. Um, and the big thing is we made it look like it was played on a VCR. So here we are, we have high tech. We have lots, you know, we have lots of gear at our, our, our disposal. Uh, you know, shooting high resolution, yet we made it look like a VCR because stylistically it tied into a theme. And so I think the thing is, I think what we need to understand better as learning folks is that the standard is going to be in making sure that the content is always meeting the need and how we can get better at measuring that, how we can get better at determining that before we can measure it so that like when we're writing, um, you know, how do we write to an audience in a script form that that's gonna convey that in a way that's better than you know just i just write i'm good at writing so i just write no it's not the same but how do we get better at doing that so i think there's it's not the technical but it's figuring out how do we measure those other things to make sure that going into it i can be like pretty confident that i'm going to be achieving what i wanted to achieve i don't know how to do that yet mm. sam's sam's working on it i, I think <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm I'm assembling a brain trust to work on it. I'm I'm uh, I'm not trying to make like standards for everybody and you know use use my standard or whatever. I'm trying to mobilize something and in help with TLDC, I've I've had a couple um, you know working sessions of like trying to get this stuff out there. So um, so John, but I don't I think we need a standard for everybody, and I think that's the beautiful thing here. We don't need like the standard like that says all learning development will be here. I think what we need is that guideline so that internally to my organization, I can say, this is our standard. This is what we should always be, or most of the time be shooting for. I uh, don't want to use always. And then we can base it off of that. And then we might come up with some someplace that's an innovation and, and that you look at Sam and say, 
oh, actually, yeah, that's a really good thing. Like, I think what we need is a baseline for everybody to say, like, here's where we think the minimum threshold is. Now let's start iterating and getting better so that when you go to your next job or your next role or your next client, you can say, these are my, this is my threshold of standards that I'm going to meet. And they might say, we want it here, but we're okay here. And you say, no, I, I want this here. Um, and so that way we have things to strive for. Because right now it's like, what's good? Define good and we right. can't. And we need right. to have at least something where we can start to say, you know what? This is this works. I could I can compare this uh, somewhat to these other things because I know you've done these – you've met these criteria. Um, because otherwise it's, it's really – we're playing in such a subjective game – um, that I mean, the ultimate and the ultimate goal is that regardless of whatever I do, is that it works for my audience and their needs. But beyond that, you know, it would be nice to be able to say, like, you know what, the quality should kind of be here, or the, these things should be true, typically. And I, I, I want to avoid the always never because there's so many there's so many latitudes that you can't do always never. But I think like typically it should have this quality of video, or the story should be able to do this, or whatever those rings of judgment might be. I don't know what we want to call them. Well, if I can make one, one always statement, I think always when we're using something for the purpose of learning, we have to know what people are going to learn and we have to know who the people are. Because if we don't know one of those two things, it's a shot in the dark, you know, and, yeah. uh, and there's a lot of stuff that, that, you know, you and I, everyone in the chat, like we, we sometimes don't know one of those two things or both of those two things. Yeah. But, uh, but in order to make some kind of uh, standard, I would say that if, if we're going to, if we're really going to be talking about learning, we have to know who's learning and what they're learning. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's an always thing. I hope it is. I, I, think I know that that's not always the work that we get, but in order for, for like to measure the output, I think it's a qualification. Well, it's, it's interesting, Sam, because the, um, the workflow that, that, that I teach in my workshops starts with step one, objective and persona. And until you, until you are clear, and I'm a bit puritanical, the objective should be following Mega's principles like we all do in instructional design. The, 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 the more concrete, the sharper, the stronger... And the more unforgiving that objective is, the better, because then we go through our video and we say, how is this piece of music helping achieve that objective for the learner? Mm -hmm. How is this picture? How is this? You know, I remember reviewing, I was working for doing a review somewhere, and they put the sunset picture into a video. And I said, what, what's this doing here? Oh, well, I got this when I was out loud. Don't you think it, like, it's a lovely picture, really nicely shot. Now, what's it doing in the video? But, it's, but don't you know what's... And they had no idea what their objective was. So I said, what, what's, it, what's it trying to achieve? Well, um, we're thinking about maybe covering something. No, 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 no. <laughs> not about what you cover. They're about what you do. And um, it, was, it, was, it was just interesting. And that's so common. Um, and we often just get so excited, we, we skip three or four steps down the road. And, and as a result, if you look at the best Hollywood directors, they are so clear about what they want out of every single picture, and that's why they're good. And I think we can do the same in the learning industry. Absolutely the same. Well, great. And, um, and we're closing up on the, the top of the hour now. Um, Greg, if people want to reach out to you, uh, how do they do that? You want to post something in the chat or say it out loud? Or? Yeah, I, I do have Twitter, but I don't use it very much. It's at GeneAggy5, and uh, I'll put my email address in there too if someone wants to ask me a question. I'm perfectly open to answer and thank you all I, I really appreciated listening to uh before i got on too before every everything you guys said jonathan everyone it was great thank you yeah thanks so much for being here and and being a part of the tldc community i'll let your uh, your video go now and um and say matt where people find you so on twitter find me at pierce mr you can find me at also if you need if that doesn't work you can it should but you can get me at TechSmith. uh as always you know check out our products if you love if you like to um, beyond that uh, we do been doing some live streams on Facebook so you can find me on Facebook well, about once a week uh, I would recommend if you want something video related we talked about how we made the last our last promo video it's kind of interesting it was a one-shot take um, so with multiple people and some interesting things so we talked about how we did that so that was interesting but that's primarily the way you can get a hold of me and I'll be at a couple events coming up uh, content marketing world 
uh, inbound uh, marketing conference and at DevLearn. So I'm speaking there and TechSmith will be there as well with a booth. And maybe stop by because maybe some new things you might want to never seen before check out. Yeah, maybe. looking forward to that. Maybe. Um, I'm Sam Rogers. I just posted in the chat. Snap Synapse is where you find me. And Jonathan, thank you again for being here. Uh, if people wanted to reach out to you and, and you know, your, your books, your workshops, your, all the things that you do, maybe anything new and exciting you've got coming, how do they do that? Oh, uh, two things. I'll put my uh, email address in there. And I have a website called rapidmediaforlearning.com. And um, it's got details of workshops and a bucket load of videos and stuff like that. It's actually still in beta mode. So um, when you go there, be a little bit forgiving because being the perfectionist I am, I'm not quite there just yet. But I'll, I'll stick that in right now. And uh, thanks, guys. Look, I remember going to the airport. You drove me to the airport in, uh, where was it? Atlanta, I think, Sam? Yeah, ATD. And, yeah, and all of a sudden we're deep in conversation and then we're at the airport and all of a sudden I'm standing up the side of the road going, wow, we only went, we went so deep, but not deep enough. So I always enjoy conversations with you and Matt, we're buddies from way back and just yeah. great to get with you guys. Appreciate that very much. Yeah. And thanks again, Matt, for making the introduction between the two of us because of course, you know, fanboy time, you know, um, well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again, Jonathan, for posting your email. Um, do you have anything like new and exciting that you can tease us with that's that you're working on or new articles or anything? Oh, yeah. In fact, I put the wrong URL in because I'm a male. I can't multitask. <laughs> I'm putting the correct one in. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very, not very good at this. Rapidmediaforlearning.com. That's it. There we go. Um, yeah, I've got some um, articles coming out on, uh, actually next week on ATD's website on, um, what do I write it on? Oh, the importance of workflow. And I actually go through the eight-step workflow that I've been teaching people. Great. So that'll be on the ATD blog. And trainingindustry.com are publishing some stuff. One of the things I've been um, really focusing for learning executives is um, using the newsroom as a, uh, a model to incorporate in the training department. If we're going to curate, create, ah. Um, we can learn a lot from the newsroom. So I put a bucket load of stuff up on that. And I've got a workshop coming up for ATD next month, actually, two-day workshop, which goes through the workflow. So thanks for the opportunity to share those. Um, a lot of fun. And if folks have got some ideas and thoughts and want to challenge some of the ideas I have, I'm also very open. Welcome that very much indeed. Great. Well, you're, you're welcome back on uh, TLD chat anytime. And uh, it's been great to have you here for Video <laughs> Friday. So thanks everybody for, uh, for joining in. Um, don't forget that, that you can become a member of TLD Chat. Check out the TLDC 18 conference. And we'll see you next week, live streaming every weekday, 8 a.m. Pacific. Catch you later. See you, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. And there, and the last one will be me.